<clears throat> okay, so I think we have everyone here. Uh, Why are people still uh, join? I'm going to start the introduction of our speaker for today, for today's um, like talk. So today we are very uh, happy to have Dr. Uh, Christiana uh, Pahaski uh, here to talk about integrating into prof interprofessional spiritual care in palliative care. Dr. Uh, Pahaski is a founder and executive director of George Washington University's Institute for Spirituality and Health and also the professor of medicine at the George Washington University. Dr. Pahaski uh, is a pioneer and international leader in the movement to integrate the spiritual health into clinical setting, education, and policy. She is an active clinician. She is the board cert certified in palliative care medicine and internal medicine and a fellow of American College of Physicians and the American Academy of Hospice and Palliative Care Medicine. Uh, Dr. Pahaski's collaborative work has influenced has influenced clinical practice on a global scale, uh, most notably the development of a course for clinicians and uh, chaplains to learn how to create uh, systematic change in their own uh, health settings. So um, I'm going to hand this over to Dr. Pahaski, and uh, we're going to take the uh, question in the end. If you have, um, so you can save the question uh, after the presentation, and you can also um, send uh, your question through the chat. Okay. Thank you very much for the lovely introduction. It's really nice to be here uh, with you, albeit virtually, but it is nice to be here with you. I wanted to talk a little bit about um, just a background of the George Washington Institute for Spirituality and Health. So we've now um, been, been in existence over 20 years. And our mission has been to uh, integrate spirituality into healthcare for all patients and families uh, through research, medical school, and clinical initiatives, professional development, and, and, and working on global health policy as well. And our, our vision is one of really of whole person care. Um, and I have a little bit of a slide about that because that's such a fundamental area of this. So this is not brand new because uh, in the last century, um, and there were people who talked about whole person care, but spirituality got disconnected from that. So it's really about reconnecting that to whole person care in general, and uh, particularly in palliative care. Um, and just, just as a very important point is spiritual care practiced by all of us clinicians and chaplain is really essential for respecting diversity, equity, and, and inclusion. So particularly in this wonderful time where we're finally recognizing how important it is to respect diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, religious and or spiritual broadly defined is such a key element of that people's values is what gives the meaning and purpose. So if we look at, um, you know, care of the physical is separated from care of the spiritual in today's healthcare system. And it uh, sometimes feels like this for people that are interested in really bringing the whole person care together. Uh, but patients and families may be suffering alone, caregivers, um, clinicians, and particularly uh, during COVID, the sort of the detachment from, from the call to serve. And, and now as we are all increasingly moving into more of a, a little bit of a corporate model in healthcare, um, the, the recognition of um, being really uh, called to a profession where you're working with people who are suffering and that can't always be done in that kind of model is, is a little bit, again, pressuring to do just what's essential. And what people often think is essential is the chief complaint and maybe it's physical. But what I'd like to say in many of us, and I want to thank Dr. Betty Farrell, who has been my collaborator and friend for many, many years, and we've done this work together, is that the spiritual is essential. This is who we are. This is what gives us meaning and purpose. And data upon data show that it really does impact how people cope with serious illness in particular, but also with life stress. So yes, today I will highlight palliative care because that's the field that I'm in and that's the field that recognizes this because we see such high levels of spiritual and existential distress, but it applies to, to, to care in general. Um, suffering is hard to witness. And uh, when, when we are present to suffering, it's to stand in the face of that suffering and not run away. 
And, and those of you that do clinical care know what that means. When we see a patient who is deeply suffering or um, when their family members are aching. You know, I, I've had two patients now die of Parkinson's very recently. And in both of those instances for the last two or three months, the wife was sitting kind of behind them and the stress and agony of knowing the end was coming, but also to see the diminishment uh, of, of the functioning of their loved one. You know, that can be hard to witness. And part of our role in spiritual care is to be present, um, to be present. And it's, it's a caring presence, but it even moves beyond that to how do we sit in silence with another and allow them to share that, that distress with them. That's really such a core part of this. So we know that models of spiritual care and training are needed to help reintegrate this hope and healing in the system. In other words, reintegrate spirituality so we can understand how people may be able to find that sense of homing, hope and meaning in their lives. So I mentioned that whole person care has been around. So Tournier um, in, in the 60s wrote a book, The Whole Person in a Broken World. He was a French um, internal medicine doctor, I believe, but then became a psychiatrist. And he started a um, movement called Medicine and Ministry. And at that time, it was bringing physicians and clergy together to talk about this area of spirituality, but also whole person care, the biopsychosocial spiritual model. And then of course, we all know about Cecily Saunders who brought that to hospice and palliative care, uh, talking about total pain, that spiritual pain is just as important to address as physical, psychological, and social. And, and then some of you may remember Engel, the biopsychosocial model of care in the US in 1977, and the spiritual was not mentioned in that. So when I was a student, we learned about biopsychosocial, but not the spiritual domain. And that in part um, inspired me to try to, uh, to bring some courses in on, on spirituality and health. Uh, and that eventually grew into, into this field that, that is um, now so respected in many parts of the world and the US. But we have a long way to go still. I mentioned Dr. Betty Farrell and Rose Verani and, and others from City of Hope. We did a um, national consensus conference in 2009 uh, in, in California and brought together uh, palliative care practitioners from all uh, uh, professions. It was totally interprofessional. There were chaplains. There were also faith community leaders and others. And part of that conference was to develop a definition of spirituality, to be broad, I'm gonna share that, but also guidelines on what does it mean to improve the quality of spiritual care as a dimension in palliative care. And that has been the sort of the first movement back into bringing spirituality into whole person care. So since 2009, we've been working on guidelines and now have a very exciting initiative I'll mention at the end of looking at demonstration projects on how this generalist specialist model, which I'll talk about, um, clinicians and chaplains working together can, can, can look like. Um, Margaret Hubner in Europe in 2011 talked about a whole person care, again, as part of an international health um, care healthcare conference with a goal of trying to modify the definition of health at WHO. While that has not happened yet, there is that um, there is a palliative care resolution, and I'll show you that where spirituality is in it. And then we we did this this work from 2009. We actually did it in in a global setting and um, refined the definition a little bit to reflect a, a global diverse group of people and some of the guidelines and what would be the next steps. So how can we operationalize this spiritual care? There's two main pillars. One is that we have to create that space for the spiritual care specialist. So I'm not exactly sure uh, uh, how many chaplains and how active they are at, at Columbia. I know I would like it to be much more at my own university, but uh, the, there are many words. So people have used chaplains in the US, in other countries, it's called a spiritual care specialist. Um, in, in this country and others, the chaplains have uh, about two years of training and then clinical pastoral education, and then they go through board certification. There are specialties, additional specialties for chaplains to be certified in palliative care. So creating that space, and that, that requires a lot of thought uh, in creating opportunities so uh, for chaplains to interact. So rather than just say all the chaplains as in my hospital will attend a code, are they part of the palliative care team? And even if the resources are such that they're not 
completely part of the team? Is there one or two, are there one or two chaplains designated to your teams? And that may already be the case, but that's really critical. And then we would really recommend that a spiritual care specialist should engage with every patient and family facing serious illness early on and at least once. So in the, within a hospital setting and, and more and more chaplains are moving into outpatient settings as well. So that's a, a key piece of this general specialist model and spiritual care. And but those of us that are clinicians, we're the generalist. So we really need to be also uh, addressing these issues. So it's a joint effort. We work closely together that follow up by both of us on spiritual distress should be dictated in part by need of the patient, but also should include regular check ins to see if new spiritual needs arise. So that's a, a really key part of, in palliative care. And I recognize how stressed again teams are, especially in hospital settings and outpatients, but um, and it'd be great to hear what you do, but it's so critical that we also do a spiritual screening and our history, depending on our role. And that we we talk to the chaplains, they get an assessment, we refer, we refer to them, but that they recommend to us how we can continue addressing spiritual issues and spiritual distress in our patients. Um, structured assessment and treatment plans are something that I've recommended and more and more of these are, are being developed. That if spiritual distress is identified, it should be addressed as urgently as physical pain and or depression. And faith community leaders, if people are affiliated with a faith community, uh, in some settings can also connect with hospital chaplains for follow-up in the faith community settings, especially uh, patients that have faith community, as uh, uh, faith-based organizations that have faith community nurses as well. That'll be a really a key link. So some of the strategies in addressing spiritual health is advocacy in the clinical setting. So um, yes, the palliative care team, this is a part that is required. Domain five of all of the requirements of palliative care is spiritual care. So that's a, a clear advocacy role within palliative care to do that using guidelines. And I, I, um, I mentioned um, the palliative care resolution, which I'll talk about shortly. Um, whole person care and mental health, WHO does have resolutions in those areas as well. So that is important. Fra framing spiritual health and distress as part of clinical care, whole person assessment and treatment plan, and then training and education. So I'm going to talk a little bit about each of these. So in terms of advocacy for spiritual care in particular, it's important to find allies and partners in the hospital. And um, again, not sure what your setting is, but I do know that in general at hospital uh, uh, systems, the chaplaincy staffing in palliative care is stressed, it's low. So um, that is an area that I think as we move forward over the next you know, five, 10 years, that has to certainly start improving. I know that there are more and more chaplains being trained, more certified in palliative care. As I mentioned and cannot underscore enough, we need to be thinking of how we would collaborate together with the chaplains. So I was recently interviewing someone and I asked how whether they were practicing spiritual care in their palliative care setting in a different hospital. And the person said, yes, we have a chaplain. So, and it was a physician and I said, so do you, but do you ask the patients? Well, I, I just make sure the chaplain sees them. So that's not the model we're talking about. We have a lot to do with being able to attend to a patient's spiritual suffering, and often they're with us much more than with the chaplains. So that's hence the collaborative effort is really important. I think working with, um, with interdisciplinary researchers are really important. And I just want to highlight that chaplain researchers are, <clears throat> they're more and more trained in that area, excuse me. <laughs> and um, Transforming Chaplaincy is a really wonderful organization, and there's more and more research on what chaplains do in, in healthcare settings. So advocacy, again, palliative care is a very friendly field to this area, as are movements in well-being, and then people who support whole person care, and we're really working more at our university, at our medical school, to have this even more visible. Um, and then again, diversity, equity, and inclusion. I've talked about how important it is in that area. So I've mentioned some guidelines. And um, so NCC has guidelines in the palliative care, that's domain five. And, um, and then the WHO quality of, res uh, uh, quality of life resolution does have a little bit on spirituality within mental health and the WHO palliative care resolution. The European Association of Palliative Care, who we've worked with, do also have specific guidelines around integrating spiritual care within palliative care. 
And then ASCO um, created a palliative care in the global setting resource stratified guidelines. I was part of that. And there is a requirement there again for addressing spiritual issues. So I'm going to move through this and move to the palliative care resolutions. I don't know how many uh, of you are familiar with this, but this, for those of you that do more global health, this was really an important um, area. And I was very fortunate to be part of this a little bit later on after it had gotten started. And the goal initially was that in underserved countries, in Africa in particular and other countries, there were no, very few opioids to manage pain. And so the primary reason for pushing for this resolution was for equal access to medications for people all over the world, and particularly within palliative care. So when I got involved, there was already a lot of work done about a definition. And, and so we were there to really enhance the spiritual domain of it. There was a little question initially because WHO has been resistant to anything around spirituality or religion. And since we define it broadly, um, there's a lot of discussion about that, but everybody uh, on that call, um, not all were palliative care practitioners, some were country representatives. It's a very formal process to have a resolution through. But the, the agreement that really, this is what palliative care is. It's the prevention and a relief of suffering by means of identification, early identification, and correct assessment and treatment of pain and other problems, whether physical, psychosocial, or spiritual. And again, this, this was uh, very unique to me at the time because we usually think of our ethical obligation. So we do, we have an ethical duty as healthcare professionals to alleviate pain and suffering again in all those domains. But it's also what the, what the committee called on, which was so strong, is that it is an ethical responsibility of health systems as well to, um, to alleviate, have, have in place ways to alleviate pain and suffering again in the whole person model. And they did give a nod to spiritual support and counseling as needed. Remember, this is a global resolution, so not all countries have chaplains, although that is now um, increasingly changing. And again, using the word spiritual care professional. Now, there's been quite a bit of research um, over the years. A lot of it was association studies, and uh, which, again, we need to move to another area of research to even get more support for this area and why it makes such a difference in patient care. But improving quality of life and wellness is a huge part of that of spiritual care, decreased depression and anxiety when people receive spiritual care. Also studies for people that are that have high levels of spirituality and or religion, um, improved um, emotional functioning. Uh, better physical well-being, better coping, adherence to treatment plans, and then social functioning and maintaining relationships. But recently, I was part of a, a very um, wonderful group out of Harvard. Tracy Balboni, um, who's a physician and radiation oncologist at Harvard, led this study. Betty and I were part of it, as many other leaders. Um, and what we did is, and Tracy led this again, is to do a systematic review of the literature and identify articles with evidence base addressing spiritual issues and serious illness or health. And so one of the goals was to apply the Cochrane criteria and, and, and rule out studies that did not have, meet, meet that criteria. So we, a lot of articles were ruled out, again, mostly association studies, but the ones that were left, we then, the, the panels um, assessed the evidence and then provided implications for healthcare. And the evidence synthesized implications were derived from the panelists' ratings. And so this was just the methodology and um, looking at spirituality and serious illness. And then there was a public health panel more looking at at the rigor of the studies regarding spirituality and healthcare outcomes. And from that, following a Delphi panel analysis, et cetera, the following were the three top rank implications for serious illness. So incorporate spiritual care education into the care of patients with serious illness, into the training of interdisciplinary team caring for patients with serious illness, include specialty practitioners. And then for the for improved patient outcomes, it was incorporate patient-centered and evidence-based um, approaches associated with uh, that were seen with community. So here, the strongest studies for evidence had to do with uh, belonging to a faith community or a spiritual community. 
And the evidence showed that there was a significant um, health benefit from that community. So um, recognizing the protective health associations of a spiritual community, and then recognizing that it's really a social factor um, associated with health in research, um, community assessments and program implications. So that paper was published in JAMA at the end of last year. Happy to get it to you if you, if you haven't seen it. So looking at the model, I mentioned working with Betty and many other colleagues, uh, and I mentioned the meeting. So then we took it to a global level to get a consensus definition of spirituality that more represented diverse group of people uh, and backgrounds. So it's really, this definition is really about meaning, purpose, and transcendence, and then experiencing connection or relationship to things that might matter a lot to people. What I wanna underscore in this definition is it's not just about religion. Um, it is about uh, how people understand and search for that meaning and purpose in their life and that sense of transcendence. So that may be a religious expression of that. It may be a secular expression of that. Um, it may be an understanding or value that there is something greater than us or um, a connection with people, value that intense connection, important connection with people, but it's however people understand that. And then experience relationship and the US, the US uh, used the word artificial and was more connection with, but here is really experiencing that relationship to self, family, others, community, society, nature, and the significant or sacred. And that it, spirituality can be expressed through beliefs, values, traditions, and practices. Again, any kind of uh, spiritual practices. So important that when we address spirituality, and I often see this with, the, with students and others where they say, do you have a faith or a religious affiliation? That is one thing that might be important to people. But again, we want to be asking at that sort of deeper understanding of spirituality. So the recommendations of those conferences are here. It's integral to patient-centered care based on honoring dignity, attending to suffering. And, and, and really, the, one of the things that we did at GWISH that, was, that I recognize would be really important in part because I know that my colleagues as physicians, I don't think that's true of nurses, but I know that that my colleagues, we are very uh, trained to go to a diagnosis. And if it's not in that category of diagnoses, it may not get addressed. And so while at the beginning people thought, sure, it's nice to know about their spirituality as kind of a social factor, uh, people didn't recognize it, that this is actually a health factor, that if people are suffering deeply, it impacts a lot of their health and, and that that really needs to be treated. And so identifying that as our role as clinicians uh, is really important and being present to our patients is so important. Generalist specialist model, again, I, I've mentioned that before, that all patients should get some sort of history of screening. This is, this is by the clinicians. And then that's integrated into a whole person treatment plan that we develop. And the provision of compassionate care is incredibly important. So here was a model that we did back then in, um, in that 2009 conference. But when in an inpatient setting, and we have a similar one for outpatient, there's going to be a screening, usually by a nurse or maybe a social worker, um, a screening on, is this person in distress, in pain, et cetera, depression? Well, there should be a question on spiritual distress. Marvin Delgado, I believe, uses um, pain in the soul. But a, a question where the, if the person is in distress at this time, there should be an immediate attention to that as there would be for pain, for serious pain. They, they then end referral to a chaplain at this point. They then move through the, the, the team, the rest of us. And so those of us that develop treatment and, and assessment and treatment plans, which might be PAs, NPs, physicians, nurses, et cetera, we would do a, a history. It's a little bit more. And then board certified chaplains do a full assessment, a much more detailed assessment, which is in itself also an intervention. And then if we do, if we are lucky to work on an interdisciplinary team, we would present together to each other, which we've done. I, I originally, before the pandemic, we had a outpatient supportive and palliative care clinic in oncology, and we interviewed patients together on the team, which was really good. The chaplain was a social worker nurse and myself. And, um, but otherwise we would, if for hospital settings, you might think about doing this in the IDT. It's integrated into the treatment plan. We measure spiritual distress outcomes like we do with anything else, reevaluation, et cetera. And while I don't have a lot of time to talk about this, our own personal and professional development is so key 
to being able to witness suffering. Because if we're, if we're not aware of what it is that gives us meaning and purpose, if we're not aware of our call to serve, um, it's gonna be hard to deal with the stresses of the healthcare system. I am an active clinician, so I know what that's like. New electronic health records, new pressures, new code. You know, most of the continuing education is on coding and billing. You know, it's a shift. And so we need to be in touch with that or we'll burn out. And there's studies that, that indicate that. And just as an aside, we do a retreat for healthcare professionals, including chaplains in CC Italy. We will be going back, hopefully, in, in August to do it in person. We've been doing it uh, virtually the last three years. So this is a very, very important part. Uh, I mentioned the generalist specialist model. Uh, again, I, I can't underscore the importance of that. All of us uh, attend to the spiritual needs of patients. I've even spoken recently, I'm collaborating with someone in Canada and they're training their CNAs on what would, they would probably do a screening, but how to even be present to a patient uh, in their spiritual distress. So this is really broadening now to different competencies for different roles. Then, you know, we need to find the chaplains. Oftentimes, as I said, you know, chaplains might be assigned to certain roles, but we need to find them and we need to, you know, identify the pastoral care office. And, and if they're not coming to your meeting, suggest it, see if that's possible. But again, equal members of the team. And I often say, don't just hit that referral button, but actually actively work with chaplains. So this is Rick Bauer. Father Rick Bauer is a very, very good friend of mine. I've known him for a long time, a missionary in Africa with HIV AIDS, policy person, social worker, and a board certified chaplain. And he's now working with us at GWISH. He's at Children's Hospital as well as adults at, at GW. And you know, we we um we really, he's great. He I I watched him at GW. I, I walked around with him and I just saw how he said, here, here's who I am. I'm here to help. The other thing that chaplains do is they, they support us. So they provide a lot of staff support. So he's always just, here I am, I can help, I can see patients, I can, you know, if you need something. So he's really, really changed some of the negative feelings about chaplaincy or that it's kind of not necessary or we don't know what they do. He has shown people at Children's and at GW, this is what a board certified chaplain does. And it's really, really fantastic. Um, and he's, uh, working with me in that outpatient clinic now. So we know that we need to create those clinical models. You know, that's so important where spiritual care professionals are and, and in conjunction with us addressing the spiritual health needs and spiritual distress of patients. And that's how I think we can operationalize a compassionate whole person model of care. Just think about some of your patients. I know many of my patients who are deeply suffering go to urgent care, go to an emergency room, and it's, you know, they're a number and they're frustrated and everybody's in line and the healthcare systems are overburdened and they just, that suffering ends up being even greater for them. So our role is so important in this. So looking at spiritual health and spiritual distress is just part of clinical care. Our Dean talks about that. If, if we're going to have a patient-centered healthcare model, spiritual health has to be uh, an integral part of that. Um, so this was the definition of health that the, the person I mentioned wanted to change, but in her, in her conference, and again, this was in Europe, primarily mostly a secular, much more secular than we were at the time in the States and, uh, looking at health as an ability to adapt and self-manage. So it's not absence of disease. Now, all of us in palliative care know that because we know that people can be really ill and yet have a good quality of life and a meaningful quality of life and function to their ability. And that's what, um, what this researcher Margaret Hubner was doing. So if we look at the domains of whole health, and this comes from Margaret's work, but you can see it around in many places that again, looking at spiritual health as a category, and then that is all of our responsibilities to address. Um, and again, you know, even uh, when we talk about social health, we, we do address that and we may work with our social worker who has more training in that area. And that's the same model around spiritual health. Now, in that same meeting in 2009, we did, um, as a group, uh, come up with potential spiritual distress diagnoses. So again, it's not simply about religious uh, issues. So it could be existential, existential lack of meaning, um, or, or it might be abandonment by God or others. 
So in, in some of our studies, it's the family is the person that, that, that is so significant in their life, or they have another concept of a energy force or some understanding, you know, that sense that of confusion around that or abandonment can be a, a real a, a, a concern. There is concerns about relationship with deity and transcendence, wanting to deepen that perhaps. I see a lot of that in my palliative care patients and in hospice conflicted belief systems, but then things that you might think are more psychological uh, are deeply spiritual. Despair, hopelessness. Uh, in fact, that that and the why me question are what I see most frequently in terms of spiritual distress. Why is this happening to me? It's not fair. My child is not yet finished in high school, or you know, it's not fair because I haven't yet accomplished all these things I wanted to accomplish, uh, or just the tremendous suffering of, of the why is this happening? And then the despair and hopelessness. There is a grieving of prior functioning and loss and then anticipatory grief and family certainly are feeling that at that time. And then there's issues perhaps around reconciliation and then there's isolation and then there might be some um, religious specific struggle issues as well. I mentioned Marvin Delgado's uh, research, but spiritual distress is associated with poor health outcomes. And these are some of the the studies that have been done in that area, as you can see, um, physical pain, depression, anxiety, lower satisfaction with life, increased risk for suicide. And back in 2016, requests for euthanasia and physician-assisted suicide was were existential uh, distress. And I still hear that in a lot of the discussions around the spiritual distress at the end of life can't be managed. Well, I think it can. And, and our presence in our accompaniment with our patients is that way and, and, and providing that sacred space for the person to be able to share. So in our ISPEC course, which some of you may have heard about, but I, I also will share a slide on that. We looked at spiritual distress um, in terms of the categories of connection, peace, meaning, and purpose. And this was a study that was done that identified needs of adults as connection, peace, meaning, purpose, and transcendence. And what I did is I looked at some of the strengths within those categories that they wrote about and correlated them with these diagnoses that I just spoke about. So if someone's talking about meaninglessness or why me, that's probably existential distress. If there's a, a loss of faith or unable to en engage current beliefs that would be unable to practice one's spiritual practices, for example, or connection, maybe being abandoned by God or others or not being in whatever community, be it faith or the yoga group or even a 12-step program, not being able to be in that community is really is really um, a, a lack of connection. So that's how we would look and guilt shame is lack of inner peace and hopelessness. Whereas the strengths would be seeking inner peace, ability to forgive, hopefulness, et cetera. So we hope that in our interventions, we move people from here to there. But that's not a that's not a quick fix. It takes time, and that's part of what we do. So I'm not I'm only going to talk about a history, but um, there are many ways to to communicate with patients around spiritual issues, and one is just recognizing themes. So the person may just tell you that I I feel I feel like there's nothing for me to hope for, and I um, I had a patient yesterday in the clinic that was like that. I asked, Are you are you depressed? And he said, no, I'm not really depressed. And I asked all those questions. And, and he says, you know, it's just really tough. I'm really struggling. And he says, I'm just wondering if I'm ever going to be hopeful again, you know, and, and was very cheerful. And, and this is a very strong kind of guy who loves to, who deals with humor as a defense and also as a way to interact and very, very powerful. Will I ever be able to hope again? And you know, what's the intervention for that? Being present, listening, tell me more. Uh, and that's that's so important. At the end of the visit, he said, well, it, it felt good just to get that out. He says, it's, I'm still struggling, but it felt good to get it out. And that's a, I want to underscore how important that is, how important that is. Following a patient's lead, responding to cues, such as something people may be wearing or a photo that they show you, uh, you know, will give you some clue into what that is. And then the formal screening history and assessment that the chaplains do. 
So these are the screenings, you know, these are the different types of more formal. Screening is usually brief. I talked about that. Spiritual history taking, I call it moderate. Um, it wasn't initially brief. It can, it can be brief depending on the conversation, but it's really more of a communication tool to find out more about the patient. And then the assessment is what the chaplains do. So I, I want to talk, this is not a real picture and the case has got the details modified, but about a patient I met early on in the pandemic and he had moved down here. Um, he had uh, suffered some pretty serious health issues, a very difficult divorce and came here to be with his family. And he came in late February and March, the shutdown occurred. So he was very, um, it was really hard for him. So my very first telehealth visit so this is the spiritual history tool, FICA. It's on our website as well, gwish.org. But it's, again, it's, it's not a research tool and it's not a quick kind of fix, uh, but it is an, a, a way to explore these questions. It's not, are you religious or spiritual? Yes or no. It's, do you consider yourself spiritual or religious? And I actually, newer virgins have dropped the religious because sometimes or, you know, I use it judiciously with my patients because sometimes people aren't religious and then they think spiritual means religious, but um, important to have that opening question. And then is it, is that something that's important to you? Um, do you have beliefs that help you cope during difficult times and always contextualize with the visit? So yesterday I happened to know this patient a long time, so I understood his spirituality. So I was more asking about his spirituality in the context of the hopeless uh, question. Um, but it's you, you want to contextualize to the visit and what's going on with them. And then always ask about what gives your life meaning. That's the second question. Um, the importance is how important is that in their lives and potentially in the, the way they care for themselves and in their decision making. So I've sometimes with goals of care, depending on how this conversation goes, I, I move in, if that's going to be what I'm going to be discussing, I move into a goals of care discussion sometimes here depending on how I sense where the patient is. Because sometimes if you bring up goals of care, sort of out of the blue, patients kind of clench and don't want to talk about it. So if I'm talking about this, yes, it does. I, it really is important to me. And then, then I might lead into that. And I found it just helpful. And then community is what that community is to people. And, um, oops, uh, and, um, and you know, what, what, what it means to them, what their spiritual community is. And uh, it could be churches, temple, mosques, like-minded friends, family, et cetera. So many different ways people understand that. And what I can't bring up is address and care. So early on when I developed this in the mid nineties, it was how can I as your clinician address this? But now it's also that assessment and plan piece. Is there spiritual distress and what needs to be done for it? Is there spiritual health? And I document that. Strong spiritual resources, meditates, has good family support, um, you know, meaning in, in the animals and or other things or art. And I, I'll document that in my note too. So for this patient's spiritual history, he was raised Catholic, but now it's more personal, it's a moral compass. And that actually ended up being very, very important because he was very um, hard on himself and had a very high... Uh, you know, bar to meet all the time and never could meet it in his life. A very, very kind of um, strong person with himself and in his family to some degree too. So that was a, a interesting uh, conversation point. Very important for him, worked with the spiritual director. Um, you know, not, it's he's isolated. So now his community is non-existent and just wondering, you know, what will, will he do with his life at whatever time he has? Because it was not clear at this time what the diagnosis was. It was early on. And he he actually said, I just, I, I just don't know how to express the pain that's inside. And so we've been, I still see him and we've been working on this actively with the chaplain as well. So a review of systems as you would do with anything else. And then these are some of the questions that I would ask in a review of systems. If the patient tells me spiritual that they're not religious, I wouldn't ask about a relationship with God. I'd tailor it to what the person um, has said. And then this is just a very abbreviated version of a whole person assessment and treatment plan, but trying to identify, you know, describe who he is and then what would be some of the things we would do for him physically, neurology referral. He ended up having Lewy body dementia and dementia and Parkinson's. Uh, so that was a little bit of what we were thinking about. And then anxiety and depression, uh, what can be done for that? He was isolated, so discussed with him other ways to connect with family that would be safe. And then 
he worked with a chaplain, which was, and still does, and this has been several years now, who has been incredibly helpful to him. And on occasion, when I get so wrought up when he's back from a hospital and there's so many things going wrong with him physically, just debriefing with the chaplain has helped me bring back the notion that, wait a minute, yes, a lot of things are happening to him physically, but he still has such strong resistance and resilience in his beliefs. And, and as a, is a, a person that, you know, we give dignity to as we would do with anyone. And that's been very important. I wanna close just briefly with talking about education. Inadequate training was the strongest predictor of uh, lack of spiritual care provisions to patient and Tracy Baloni did that study. So we tried to meet that need by developing the interprofessional spiritual care education curriculum. And this was our very first group. And um, you'll see Betty over here, or the co-leader and Trace Haythorn, who's a, a leader in chaplaincy. And Noreen is a wonderful palliative care leader in Singapore. So we had a, a quite a global audience. But clinicians and chaplains come together um, that was a two and a half day. We've since made it two days and six modules. And so we teach people, the, ch the pairs, how to teach, how to learn this and then teach it to their colleagues when they go back. And we've been now doing two a year. Um, virtually, we're now starting, we're going to do our return to first per in person in, in June um, at GW. And then the second one in the year will be virtual. And we found the virtual to be useful, especially for, for people in the global setting. And these are just the overall objectives of the whole course. So you can see it's about module one is really what you learn to be a leader. You know, what are the guidelines? What's the evidence? How do you do some implementation? Um, spiritual distress is the second one in health and how do we identify that? This is a very important module, practicing compassionate presence and the skills for that, eliciting spiritual issues, whole person plan. And then this module six is about us. How do we understand our spirituality? As Rick often says, if you don't have your stuff together, you can't be present to the other patient because they're going to be spilling all their suffering and then we're not going to know how to handle it and potentially harm them. So we really need to, to work on our own development as well. Our, this is our new initiative, which we're actively working on. Again, Betty of City Hope and, and Trace Haythorn, um, we're working collaboratively on this. And this is to advance spiritual care in in. Uh, interprofessional spiritual care, but in everyday clinical practice. So uh, we're focusing primarily in this cycle in palliative care and in, in future cycles, we'll be broadening that as well. And we really see this, I've experienced this as a movement. And uh, just since I started in, in the nineties, I felt sort of alone. And over the years, there's so many people that are interested in this and particularly my colleagues in palliative care. So, so many great people are doing great work in this arena. And we're just hoping now to just bring everybody together and, and do that kind of critical work that's necessary to move this to a field. Very similar um, way that palliative care became a field through education of the workforce, I spec, and through devel developing demonstration projects of how this generalist specialist model works. So if you're interested, please feel free to contact me. We are uh, working with partners around um, the country right now. Many of these partners are listed here. And then just a closing that I think, you know, instead of working alone and pushing up that stone, uh, that rock up the, the boulder up the hill, there are now many people involved in this. And I think together is how we can help reintegrate hope and healing into our health systems through the integration of spiritual care. So thank you so much for your attention. Um, there is, there's a phone here and here's my email. If you wanna email me, I'm very, very happy to do that. And I think we may have a little bit of time for questions and answers. Thank you so much. And we have um, uh, a few comments, more like comments uh, instead of questions. First of all, regarding the slides. So we are going, we, we are recording the, the seminar. If you are interested in uh, learning more, you can email uh, uh, our center and we can send you the, uh, the recording uh, to you. So um, one comment is from uh, Dr. Uh, Malin Makil, and she's a chaplain service very active both in the uh, Columbia inpatient outpatient center. So, um, um, and uh, we also have a comment uh, suggested including the social worker uh, uh, service in the palliative care. I think it uh, uh, the, the, uh, just uh, stated it, it, it is included in the service. So let's open to the audience for any other questions. 
And I just, I see Robin Kinneric here, my good friend. Hi, Robin. And just to thank her, because we started with the iSpec for adults. And thanks to Robin, we also have iSpec pediatrics. So our module four and five is very specific to pediatrics. And then we just are finishing developing one for faith community leaders. So I want to acknowledge Robin. That's been great working with you. Okay, so if there's no questions, I have a question, uh, uh, Dr. Popovsky. So um, you're talking about the, uh, the in integrate uh, the uh, spirituality care in the clinical care. So my research area, I'm, I'm serving my, my own uh, research purpose is in home health care setting. And uh, right now the home health care there expand the uh, service to include the palliative care. Uh, we are, in the process to uh, to assess the uh, the clinicians uh, like um, readiness to provide uh, palliative care, and uh, so do you think any specific education or may maybe training module we can provide to the clinician to the current uh, the the home health care clinician to help them to um, to increase their knowledge of the uh, palliative care and specifically in the in the uh, uh, spiritual care. So we. Part of iSpec is also an online course. So, mm -hmm. so that's not to train the trainer. That's kind of a basic course. So that's something, and we just now revamped it. So we have a new version coming, uh, an updated, not new, updated probably next month. They'll be active online, but that would be available. I just want to ask you, when you say home care clinician, are you talking about the CNAs? Uh, no, home health care clinician, the RNs, uh, therapist, uh, uh, the uh, physical therapist, uh, like uh, occupational therapist. So, yeah, CNA definitely is part of the home health care clinician. Yeah. So we have had people come to our training program who have been physical therapists, occupational therapists, and others. And mm -hmm. in fact, at our own uh, school, the the, um, the occupational therapy department division is really interested in this because that's actually what they do is to try to understand the whole person. Um, and so, yes, there are, and, and people in those professions have taken the online course and have found it beneficial. So okay. that's Elias.com. Um, and I'm, I'm, a, I'm happy if you want to email you, I'm happy to mail that, uh, email me, I'm happy to email that link and we will have continuing education credits for that as well. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, uh, let's see, any, I don't want to take all the time for my questions. Any other question for the audience? I just, can I just share uh, a thought? Um, Dr. Pukowski came to Fairfield University a few years ago and was talking about spiritual distress in adults. And um, incredibly she everything she described was exactly what i had a son who passed away from a very complicated stem cell transplant and when he was in strict isolation he started having major behavioral changes and no one on the healthcare team would address the fact of what was going on and it wasn't until 20 years later that I heard Dr. Pukowski talk about this. And it was an absolute mind blowing moment for me because no one in the healthcare field had addressed these needs. And, um, and it just allowed me to fully heal. So I am indebted to Dr. Pukowski for bringing this up. And I have to tell you, and I know several parents who've lost children and children are very, very aware. And, uh, and this is something that has to be integrated into, especially for children who are at end of life. Um, you, you have to be willing to have these very difficult conversations. So thank, thank you, Dr. Pukowski. Thank you so much. And I, you know, as you're talking, because I showed you the picture of Chaplain Bauer in front of Children's Hospital, he sometimes will share with me not exact details, but of, you know, the what's going on in the NICU, what's going on in, in, with kids who are, um, 
you know, have been abused in other situations and, and palliative care for sure, you know, end of life and how, how that's, this is such incredibly important for the families as well, for the parents that are sitting there, you know, where uh, they weaned a, ch um, a young child, I don't know how old was a baby, um, they weaned them off the ventilator and then the, the family just sort of left because they didn't know how to handle that. It was so hard for them, you know, and, and I think that the presence of, of a chaplain certainly is important, but of a clinician. And he described how he came back because he was so worried about the baby too. And this, the nurse was holding the child and just saying, okay, you can let go now, you can let go now. And it's just a, such a beautiful thing. And she talked about the importance of spiritual care in these, especially in these situations, but it's across all the board, children, adolescents, uh, my older adults who have dementia, who, for whom it's very important to be able to reconnect with where they were in the past in terms of their faith and what, or, or what gives them meaning, not necessarily faith. So um, I, I think it's incredibly, incredibly important in palliative care and we should be documenting in our notes and we need to be addressing it because that's often, uh, especially when people are, are really suffering in those situations, it's, it's so important. Um, and someone is just saying that isolation, depression, yeah. Yeah, and isolation, absolutely, um, Ina, I guess was saying this, isolation depression needs to be addressed as early as possible. And mm -hmm. absolutely 100% correct. And we need to be able to identify, this is not so easy, you know, if it's despair, is it despair and depression? Um, is, you know, what are we dealing with? And, and that's why, again, why we need to be so uh, intimately involved in these discussions with our patients. And, and often, you know, we may be able to be that spiritual presence for them in the sense of being compassionate and present until they can have time to see a chaplain or, or often more and more clinicians are learning skills to be able to do at least sort of the generalist way of being present and talking to patients. I think that's so key. But recognition of isolation and you know and depression and spiritual distress is is huge. I've also had people who were given medication by my colleagues for depression, but that wasn't really what was going on. It was really spiritual distress. So again, how to how to know what is the best treatment for what's going on? And frequently those two do overlap. Yeah. Um and uh, I, another um, like uh, comment I want to make is just often uh, people will, when we think about the spiritual care, we often think about religion care, but uh, you said very well, this beyond the religion care, it can be like um, uh, the, the meaning of life or culture like involved. But when you talk about uh, the service usually is provided by chaplain, how, how does chaplain like integrate all these like um, uh, is, I, I guess my question is the, uh, the service provided by chaplain is, it will be on the, uh, the uh, spiritual care, right? It's, it's like uh, uh, how they integrate other, uh, the like a culture, belief, and uh, um, the like maybe the the, the personal uh, life experience into the care. So the training of chaplains um, is it's a clinical training. Uh, chaplains may or may not be religious. There are atheist chaplains. There are agnostic chaplains. There's Buddhist chaplains. There's you know uh, religious chaplains. But they're trained to be attentive to what the patient needs, and they're really good training that really good boundary. So it's not about their beliefs so much, but helping to find out what is going on with the patient at that time. And it's not just strictly spiritual, or if the patient is religious, it's also not strictly religious. It's where are you today? Tell, tell me what's going on with you. They're, they're really good in contemplative listening, which is a skill that it takes some time to learn that. And they have the training to be able to do that and the training to be able to discern what's going on and what the needs might be. So, um, you know, for example, if the patient is religious and the patient is, I've, I've heard a chaplain tell me this story many years ago, the patient was saying, just pray for me, uh, you know, pray right now, I want to pray. But the chaplain was getting into some really interesting issues. And so, yes, we'll do that later. But right now, I want, I want to still continue with the story, because this, the, what, was, what was going on with that patient um, he could tell he was just asking for prayer to cut that off because he was getting into some important issues. They do have training in, um, in counseling. They have training in, uh, they're not certified counselors. It's a different training, but they, they are 
are trained in depression, anxiety, and others, so they know how to differentiate whether it's a spiritual issue or something else. So board cert again, these are board certified chaplains. They're, they're, that's important to distinction. Okay, that's very good to know. Thank you. And then someone said in the chat box that there's a fellowship in four chaplains there. Um, I'm, I'm lost the type, but one of the programs, there's a fellowship training for, for chaplains. So as I mentioned, there is that certification opportunity for palliative care chaplains, for chaplains who are board certified to get additional certification in palliative care. Okay. And I think we have another question from uh, Susan. Uh, I'm happy to see all these. Yes. Um, I just wanted to put a plug in for the importance of the somatic piece of addressing spiritual distress and that there are so many modalities now that might be considered alternative but are so basic. Um, grief and trauma live in the body and being able to address that and help move that through um, can make a big difference for patients and family, as well as things like music, thanatology, pet therapy, the arts. These all access different areas, areas of spiritual distress and moral distress and emotional, all of it. Um, so um, contemplative care, which really helps people be very present to what is in the moment. And so I just wanted to throw in that little plug. Well, and it's great if you, if in the ISPIC course, we list all those other different modalities um, so that, you know, chaplaincy, ha I think that's a really critical partner in the healthcare team um, for addressing spiritual distress. And again, it's not just prayer and others, and, and um, but all these other uh, therapy for children, play therapy, you know, a lot, we've had some play therapists come to our course because again, the, where they interact with children at that time is a way of recognizing what may be spiritual or existential distress without that child say, putting those kind of labels on them. So, and I think yeah. that- it, I, I think um, child life specialists are very skilled in this. And, and I want to put a plug in for social workers as well, because we're highly trained with spiritual care as well. Um, and it is part of the integration of the whole team. It is. Yeah, absolutely. My very close colleague, Carolyn Jacobs, is a major leader in social work and spirituality. She was a former dean of social work at Smith and has been and is now going to be doing a, a C suite retreat with us. So we're lucky to have her. But again, I think that the whole team is important OT, PT, counselors, you know, social work, et cetera. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. And that's what I loved about our oncology clinic because I had the four, the big four. We didn't have physical therapy. That would have been an OT. That would have been a good one. But, you know, at least we started with the four. Okay. I, I think we are uh, close to the uh, to the end. And um, I was wondering, uh, Dr. Uh, Pogoski, can we get the link to the, the continued education so we can send it to the audience? I will, I will do that. Yes. Okay. That would be wonderful. Um, do any other questions? Okay, if not, I just want to thank uh, Dr. Pukowski for again for the wonderful presentation and uh, um, just keep eye on for our next uh, uh, the seminar uh, from our center. Thank, thank you so you much. Thank you for having me here today. Thank you.